Thanks very much for coming to this event today. I, you know, this uh, we couldn't uh, do any better than bring Bruce Hoffman to campus. Uh, uh, the first line of Bruce's bio uh, took me aback this morning when I read it. It said he's been studying terrorism and insurgency for nearly 40 years. That means he started when he was seven. Uh, I, I came here when I was 11, so that makes us about the same age. Well, that's why I've gone to beard, so I can really be a gray beard. A gray beard. Uh, uh, Bruce is the director of the Center for Security Studies and the director of the Security Studies Program and a tenured professor at, at Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service. Uh, it, that's almost a sidelight. Uh, for Bruce, given everything else that he has done and has been doing. He's clearly the leading terrorism scholar in the world. Pause. Uh, and that might be a sidelight, given everything else that he does. I won't go through all the stuff. You can find his bio on the website. But he's an extraordinarily broad and deep public intellectual who's uh, given tremendous service to our country and to the world and all the things that he's done over the years. Among the things that uh, I will mention is that uh, he was also the founding director <clears throat> for the study, or the Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Many of you are interested in the field may have seen things coming out of St. Andrews. They have a, a, an incredible program there thanks to Bruce, and he still travels there to do some, some teaching uh, from time to time. Uh, like me, Bruce also finds time to be an editor. He's the editor-in-chief of, of the best journal in the field, Studies of, in Conflict and, and Terrorism. His degrees are uh, finished uh, with a doctorate from, from Oxford, and he continues to, to write amazing books, and he's here today to talk about one of them that uh, he was kind enough to send to me last week. I'll, I'll send it around and let you take uh, take a look at its uh, breadth and depth. This is, of course, on Anonymous Soldiers, The Struggle for Israel, 1917 to 47. The book, is, if you've paid attention, has already been reviewed by the New York Times, Sunday Book Review, The Washington Post, The Chronicle, The New York Review of Books. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, so please join me in welcoming Bruce Hoffman. Thanks very much, Bill, for that really kind introduction. Like Professor Banks, I'm also a little bit under the weather. In fact, I was in bed earlier this week. I've, I've sort of recovered, but uh, but I just had a very stimulating discussion with three of the PhD students in the Maxwell School. It was sort of riveted on contemporary issues of terrorism, and especially with this kind of head cold as well. Uh, now switching gears is, is a little bit uh, challenging. Uh, I realize we only have till 12.50. So I'm really going to strive to not speak for more than 25 minutes or a half hour at the most. Because most of the time, people come not so much to hear the speakers, but to ask questions. Uh, the book is being passed around. Uh, is over 600 pages. Uh, that's about 250,000 words. The original version, the first, the final draft that I handed to the publisher was nearly twice that size. Uh, it took me a year to cut 150,000 words out of it, so now I've got the challenge of condensing even what remains into only 20 or 25 minutes. So let me just do, focus on three things um, to sort of give you a sense of the book. Firstly, some context uh, about the British mandate for Palestine. And I suppose the big question is, you know, was the British mandate for Palestine doomed to failure? And how did even the British mandate for Palestine uh, uh, come about? Secondly, let me talk about three or four of the key personalities. I think there's about a six-page who was who in the back of the book, so three or four of the personalities is, is, isn't even a snapshot, it's a thimbleful. But it'll give you some idea of some of the, the key personalities from this period. And then lastly, I'll talk about some of the broader issues it raises for contemporary terrorism and also some of the more controversial points uh, that, it, that, it, that, it, that it makes. Uh, so, firstly, some of the context uh, you know, on the British mandate for Palestine. Uh, in December 1917, uh, forces commanded by General Sir Edmund Allenby uh, conquered Jerusalem and, in essence, brought Palestine under British rule. It wasn't for another year that he actually consolidated uh, his conquest of the country. Before then, Palestine hadn't been a single 
administrative entity. It was actually two provinces uh, that were part of the Ottoman Empire, ruled mostly out of, uh, out of uh, Damascus. Uh, and Britain in 1922 was awarded by the League of Nations a mandate to prepare Palestine for eventual independence as, in essence, a binational state. So that's kind of the, the broad outline to drill down a little bit more deeply to understand why or what undermined the British mandate for Palestine. One has to go to the two conflicting promises that Britain made to both the Arabs and the Jews during World War I. In 1915 and 1916, the High Commissioner for Egypt, Sir Henry McMahon, entered into correspondence with Sheriff Hussein of Mecca. If you've seen the film Lawrence of Arabia or read Seven Pillars of Wisdom, I mean, that's in essence what this was about, where the British solicited the, the cooperation of, 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 uh, of Hussein to overthrow the Ottomans um, and promised in return that those territories previously governed by, by the Turks would be granted their independence at the end of the war. And if you remember the film Lawrence of Arabia, if you've read the book, this was the sweep northwards for up the Hejaz, uh, the conquest of Aqaba, then through present day uh, Jordan, that culminated in 1918 with the capture of Damascus. That was one part of the pincer. The other part of the pincer was General Allenby's uh, Egyptian expeditionary force, which had been repulsed two previous times in its attempts to invade Palestine. Um, General Allenby took over command in what's still studied in war colleges as a textbook military operation. In a flanking movement, um, captured Beersheba, and then took Gaza from behind and then marched on uh, Jerusalem. So you've got 1915, 1916, this correspondence between the senior British representative in the Middle East uh, promising freedom uh, to the Arabs if they rise up and support the British. And then, of course, a month before Allenby conquers Jerusalem, you have Britain issuing the Balfour Declaration, which was a statement by the foreign minister, Arthur Balfour, to Lord Rothschild, who was one of the presidents of the Zionist organization in Britain, that pledged British support to facilitate the establishment in Palestine of a Jewish national home. So therefore, from the very start, you've got two conflicting uh, promises. Uh, true to their word, uh, the British, with the end of World War I, permits wide-scale Jewish immigration to Palestine. In point of fact, not that many immigrants come. But the arrival of even a few new immigrants in 1919 uh, sparks the first uprising or outbreak of violence um, by the Arab inhabitants of Palestine. And this is the 1920, 1920 riots, uh, which occur in Jerusalem. Um, the following year, more serious rioting again erupts in Jerusalem and subsequently spreads to Jaffa, uh, to Tel Aviv, to Petah Tikva, to basically the towns in, in the central part of, of, of Palestine. And in response to that, the British adopt a, po a new policy governing immigration. And it's called, uh, that, well, it basically stipulates that immigrants now, rather than being any Jewish immigrants who wanted to come, could come to Palestine, now their number would be fixed in accordance to the economic absorptive capacity of Palestine. And that was something that the High Commissioner, the senior British official in Palestine, would determine. And this inadvertently, at least I argue in the book, had the effect of demonstrating that British policy could be influenced or persuaded by uh, violence. And there's a brief hiatus after the 1921 riots, um, which I think is mistaken by the British as this period of quiescence where the Arabs in Palestine had reconciled themselves to Jewish settlement and Jewish uh, land purchase. And instead, what we see during that period is this very powerful fusion of religion and politics, whereas Palestinian nationalism becomes something now that, that is tied very closely to Islam, to resisting an alien threat that uh, the leader of the Palestinian Arab community, who I'll talk about in a minute in a little bit more detail, uh, the Mufti Hajamin al Husseini. Um, really links these two forces, appeals to people not just on abstract an abstract political basis, but in a very visceral, emotional basis, uh, um, even talks in terms of jihad, for example. And this results in the, really the, the nationwide rioting that convulses Palestine in August of 1929. 
Uh, British response is to send a commission to investigate the first of 22 commissions that were sent to Palestine during the 31 years that, that Britain ruled there. Um, each of them recommended various things. Um, this commission actually uh, recommends almost a complete restriction on Jewish immigration and land purchase. Uh, this was in this was codified in the, what's known as the Passfield White Paper. Uh, Lord Passfield was the colonial secretary. But before it can actually be implemented, uh, the Jews in Israel and the Zionist lobby, uh, particularly in Britain, mobilize and persuade the first labor prime minister, uh, Ramsey MacDonald, to reverse it. If you know anything about Palestinian history, this is what becomes known as the MacDonald Black Letter, where basically the prime minister repudiates his colonial secretary and bows to Zionist pressure. But again, I would argue the handwriting is on the wall that violence can have a very uh, decisive um, impact on British policy. Uh, of course, 1933, just a few years later, Adolf Hitler becomes chancellor of, uh, of Germany. <coughs> the persecution of Jews begins. And between the period of 1933 and 1935, you have a tremendous upsurge in Jewish immigration as Jews begin to flee Europe, uh, not only Germany, but began to begin to leave, particularly Poland, uh, but also Russia. In fact, in those, those three years alone, six times as many Jewish immigrants arrive in Palestine as the previous uh, decade um, combined. Obviously, this new influx of Jewish uh, immigrants creates yet another fulminate uh, for violence, and this erupts in the 1936 Arab Rebellion, which is significant uh, mainly because it wasn't only an expression of Arab opposition to the Zionist endeavor, but also now, for the first time, you have Palestinian Arabs attacking British targets as well. So it becomes not just opposition to Zionism, but an attack against British rule and an attempt to, um, once again, either persuade, uh, change, or persuade the British to change British policy or else actually to drive the British um, from, uh, from Palestine. And the culmination of this, which again only solidifies this notion that violence pays, is the 1939 White Paper, which is an enact, enacted in May 1939. And this basically um, cuts off all Jewish immigration. It allows for a, really a minimal number of Jewish uh, immigrants over the next five years, uh, especially as, 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 as World War II is about to erupt. It closes one of the few remaining avenues for Jews to escape Europe. Um, so it imposes severe restrictions on Jewish immigration during a five-year grace period and says states that thereafter no immigration will be permitted without Arab approval. And then also it proposes the following year, which do take effect in 1940, drastic restrictions on Jewish purchase of land in Palestine. In essence, about 97% of Palestine is declared off limits to any Jewish uh, land purchase. And out of this milieu um, had arisen uh, a Jewish underground group uh, calling itself uh, the Irgun Svailenomi, or National Military Organization. Um, this was a group, you know, especially these days with Benjamin Netanyahu's re-election. I mean, terms like right wing and left wing are thrown about so often that I think they almost become uh, meaningless. I would say that. The Irgun grew out of the Haganah, which literally means defense, which was the nucleus or the, the, the embryo of what eventually became the Israel Defense Forces. And the Haganah had, throughout this period, ascribed to a, period, a, 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 a doctrine of what they called purity of arms, where that arms would only be used in defense. Now, this is in the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, following the 1929 riots, the Irgun said that defensive use of weapons wasn't enough, that only offense could address the problem of Arab attacks on Jewish immigrants and Jewish property and Jewish um, residents of, uh, of Israel, and had begun training to, in the event of some new outbreak of violence, to engage in its own form of counterterrorism, or basically use terrorist tactics against Arab targets, exactly the same as, 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 as Arabs were doing against Jews. And the Irgun in 1937, very shortly after the Arab Rebellion began, embarks on a campaign of, of counterterrorism or a campaign of terrorist attacks on Arab targets, often civilian targets. So you have this very, very uh, messy, tit-for-tat escalatory struggle that really um, plunges Palestine into violence and chaos. 
On the eve of World War II, the last thing Britain wanted was to have 40,000 of its sorely needed troops tied down with policing this wayward mandate. Um, not only were those troops more urgently needed for defense of Britain in the event, as it seemed very likely in 1938 especially, that Britain was going to go to war at some point in time against Nazi Germany, but also in the event that uh, Germany allied with Italy especially, who was the local Mediterranean power, attempted to close the Suez Canal, which was, of course, Britain's lifeline to the rest of the empire in India and the Far East, um, those troops would be needed to be brought overland to reopen the canal. And they could obviously not pass through a Palestine that was engulfed in violence. So this was part of the impetus of why the British were firstly determined to ruthlessly suppress the Arab rebellion, which they did. Um, when one looks back on uh, the, the, the means that were used, I mean, it was a very kinetic form of counterinsurgency, I suppose is the best way to put it in a contemporary vernacular. For example, uh, the city of Jaffa, uh, with a port, there was, um, when cargo was being brought in, there were repeated attacks uh, on, on the transport, bringing it into the interior of Palestine. And in 1936, the Royal Air Force basically bombed a quarter through this very crowded urban area to create, let's say, a DMZ or some demilitarized zone. So bombing of Arab villages uh, with aircraft, um, indirect artillery fire was, was not at all unusual. But the British realized that even though they could militarily defeat, after considerable exertion, the Arab rebellion, they needed a way to at least politically assuage the grievances of Palestine's Arabs. And that's what resulted in the white paper. So then you have the year good. Britain has closed the gates to Palestine, um, has now promulgated this policy that repudiates the Balfour Declaration. And in May 1939, the Irgun decides to rise up and revolt against the British. And in fact, in their own documents and in their own propaganda, the Irgun says, you know, quite candidly, the Arabs are using violence and terrorism and they're winning. This is what we need to do. So that's really what sets in motion uh, the conflict. Uh, the Irgun, just parenthetically, when a few months later, when Britain declares war on Germany after the invasion of Poland, um, decides to support the British war effort amidst some controversy, and I'll come back to this in a second, a radical offshoot of the Irgun does not agree with this truce and breaks apart and forms uh, the Stern Gang. So that's basically the crux of uh, the context of the conflict. And it's one where, as I said, both sides by the 1930s had reached the conclusion that the Britain can be, British policy can be affected through the use of violence. And you find this in 1947, where the most senior British officials in Palestine are complaining both amongst themselves and to London that this is exactly the problem. Everyone believes that violence can persuade us, and that's why we have this now post-war uh, Jewish terrorist campaign directed against the British. So that's kind of the big picture. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the personalities. Um, Haj Amin al-Husseini is a good person uh, to start with. Um, uh, the Mufti of Jerusalem, so the senior Palestinian uh, religious figure. Uh, he was a member of one of the two prominent families in Palestine, uh, Haj Amin himself, um, in addition to having made the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, had, uh, had distinguished himself even before World War I as a young student at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, where he founded and led a, a group that was now, this is pre-World War I, when there had been two Jewish waves of immigration, when the new Jewish immigrants to Palestine was rel relatively small, I mean, if not uh, modest. He had distinguished himself by organizing a group to protest even the Ottomans' restrictive immigration policies in, in, for the fear that Jews would come and take over the land. So he had already been an activist before World War I, served in the Ottoman army, and was in fact one of the ringleaders of the 1920 riots. And for his role in the 1920 riots, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison by a British military court. Uh, the first High Commissioner of Palestine, Sir Herbert Samuel, was a very prominent uh, um, British labor politician, uh, was a Jew himself. Perhaps for that reason, he wanted to demonstrate, or overcompensated to try to demonstrate his impartiality and decided that it would perhaps, I think this is one of the major miscalculations in, 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 in the history of the British rule of Palestine, but he thought firstly pardoning Hajamin from prison, 
And secondly, giving him senior political office would actually moderate his extremist views. So Haj Amin, in addition to becoming the, the Mufti of Jerusalem, he styled himself the Grand Mufti, but in fact the title was Mufti. He also became the president of the Supreme Muslim Council, which was the senior most Palestinian Arab uh, leadership body dealing with um, the British. It did not moderate his views. He was um, his role in the 1921 riots is less clear, uh, but he was obviously then trying to stay out of prison. Uh, but he certainly had a, a signal role in the 1929 riots in achieving this fusion of religion and nationalism, I would argue, and then was one of the, the driving forces behind the 1936 to 1939 Arab rebellion. In 1937, he fled Palestine, never to return uh, to his homeland. He went into exile initially in Beirut, uh, then subsequently in Baghdad, in Rome, and eventually in Berlin. And one of the more interesting documents that I found in my research at the National Archives in, in College Park, Maryland, didn't make it, it was one of those things that actually got cut from the 150,000 words I had to dispense with the pain of death from my editor, um, was a document I found um, that listed the salaries of Hitler's favorites and the Nazis' favorites, and astonishingly, Haj Amin's salary was equivalent to the most senior field marshal in the German army. Basically, he was earning as much as uh, field marshal Erwin Rommel. So he was very closely, of course, associated with the Nazis and with uh, the Balkan SS. And as I said, died in exile, never, never to come back to, uh, to Palestine. Uh, another intriguing figure in the book is Abraham Stern. Uh, he was the individual who, when the Irgun declared this truce because Britain was, of course, at war with Nazi Germany, which posed a greater menace to Jewry than uh, European Jewry, at least, uh, than, 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 than Britain. Um, Stern was a student, actually, it was, I, I, I was about to say he's a student of history. He was actually a classicist. I mean, he's one of these people that is an astonishing paradox. Uh, he was actually uh, an extremely accomplished classicist. He was a student of Judah Magnus, who was the first uh, president of Hebrew University, who was someone who was a profound moderate, who never believed in, he always believed that Palestine should be a binational, unitary country, that should never be partitioned into separate Jewish and Arab states. Obviously, Stern had much more extreme views. He believed that Palestine should actually be part of a broader Jewish kingdom that would stretch uh, uh, across the Middle East. Um, Stern was, you know, on the one hand, a classicist and a poet. Uh, he was also a dandy and a womanizer um, and, a, and a zealot as well. He won a very prestigious scholarship and studied classics in Rome and there was, became very much uh, uh, consumed with the profound assertions of Italian nationalism that Mussolini uh, was advocating. Came back to Palestine and rather than pursuing, continuing his academic career, actually joined the Irgun and became a terrorist. Um, he was an extremist even within the Irgun and refused to go along with the truce. Um, as a student of history, as well as a classicist, going back to my earlier point, he had studied intently, as did the Irgun, um, the experience of the Irish nationalists in rising up against Britain in 1916 during the uh, Easter uprising and then, of course, in the War of Independence, which lasted until the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. And Stern, just like Michael Cal Collins and Patrick Pierce and James Connolly, advocated that now, when Britain was consumed with preparations for the war against Germany and was going to be enmeshed in the struggle against Germany, this was exactly the time to rise up and revolt, just as the Irish had seen was Britain as being, had been completely uh, enmeshed in the trench warfare of the Western Front during World War I. That was why the Easter Uprising in April 1916 was mounted, was to sort of catch Britain off guard and wrest control of Ireland's <coughs> destiny by these revolutionaries at a time when Britain was preoccupied oh. elsewhere. That was Stern's argument. Um, he then extrapolated that into not just a Jewish state, but as I said, this, this transnational, almost supranational Jewish kingdom. I think he was so desperate in achieving this goal that it drove him to seek an alliance, uh, firstly with uh, Italy, and then subsequently to send an emissary to Beirut to meet with the Nazis, where he had in mind to propose, which in retrospect is, you know, this harebrained scheme, but in the logic of the times, this was before the Bonn Sea Conference in 1940, January 1942, so before news of the final solution. This was the beginning of World War II, where he believed that he could reach some sort of modus vivendi with Hitler 
that Hitler wanted to get rid of the Jews, Stern said, this is great. Send them all to Palestine, and we'll defeat the British Empire, and then you can spread Nazi rule and just leave us alone. So this mad scheme never got off the ground. Uh, the senior Stern gang uh, emissary was arrested en route um, to Beirut. And this is all documented in various Israeli archives, and especially in the British national archives. But significantly, uh, this is, I think, what makes it very useful to work in multiple archives. In researching the book, it once again, in Suitland, Maryland, in the United States' own archives, and it's one of those things you happen to come across as you meticulously go through boxes of files. This is a fascinating um, memorandum of a conversation between Cornell Hull, FDR's Secretary of State, with a Polish ambassador in exile in 1940, where they're discussing an intelligence report that the Stern gang was making overtures to, to Nazi Germany and the fears that Germany might bite on this. So this was actually not, you know, this was not something that's, you know, some sort of a canard. This was part of Stern's mad scheme to sort of seize the moment and to create a, a, a Jewish state I mean, heinously in, in alliance with the Nazis. Um, Stern himself never got very far. He was actually <coughs> shot to death by police in February 1942. It's the subject of another book called The Reckoning by Patrick Bishop uh, that was recently published as well. And then the group under different leadership, including a future uh, foreign minister and prime minister of Israel, uh, Itzhak Shamir, Stern Group um, continues. But in my estimation, the Stern Group never had a Lechi, which is the Hebrew acronym, which means Freedom Fighters for Israel. Um, never really had more than a few hundred people. And generally speaking, except for one, um, well, one signal incident that it was responsible for, which actually turned out to be enormously counterproductive, um, they assassinated Lord Moyne, who was the British Minister of State resident in the Middle East, that is to say, the senior most British official in the entire region, uh, actually a person of cabinet stature, two members of the Stern Gang, who that's actually Yitzhak Shamir, dispatched to Cairo in September 1944, two months later assassinated Lord Moyne. Lord Moyne was one of Prime Minister Churchill's uh, closest allies and also one of his best friends. And with Moyne's assassination, Churchill abandoned what would have been a daring, ambitious plan to partition Palestine. Now, in a very uncharitable review that appeared in the New York Times, uh, the reviewer dismisses this and says that it was a pipe dream. I have no objections to reviewers differing with my opinion, but, you know, as the late New York Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan famously said, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts. The facts of the matter, that and the archives don't lie, and this is information that one can find in both the British archives and in the Israeli archives, is that that plan to partition Palestine was quite genuine. That Churchill, as a member of the Conservative Party, it was the Conservative Party under Neville Chamberlain, the appeaser, of course, that uh, had promulgated the 1939 White Paper. And Churchill had always, from the time he was first elected to Parliament at the beginning of the 20th century, had always been a friend of the Jews, had always had a large number of Jewish constituents, had always been a, a supporter of the Zionist enterprise, and was on record as opposing the white paper, even though it was the, it was the policy of his own party. And once in office, even in the midst of World War II, and believe me, this is voluminously documented in the British archives. This is not something that may, you know, that was a pipe dream. I mean, it ended up to be a pipe dream because of the smoke of two, the assassin's pistols. But this was a serious plan by Churchill, basically to partition Palestine into separate Jewish and Arab states at the end of World War II, to sort of solve the Palestine problem. And his idea basically was to enlist the support of President Roosevelt and Field Marshal uh, Stalin to do so. And in fact, he had proposed in 1944 that the Big Three conference that end up, ended up being held in Yalta in February 1945, which in fact should take place in Jerusalem. And that in Jerusalem, he would present to both Roosevelt and to um, Stalin the plan as one of the steps when the war ended to partition Palestine at the point of British bayonets, but backed up by the United States and by uh, the Soviet Union. I mean, whether history could have been different or not, we obviously don't know. But this was a genuine plan. We see in the archives, in fact, that on November 2nd, um, 
Churchill had lunch with Chaim Weizmann, who was sort of the leading um, uh, first president of Israel, the leader of the Zionist movement. And there, Weizmann says to him, this is in Weizmann's papers, it's not just in the British official papers, same conversation is reported by Churchill's private secretary in the British official papers and in Weizmann's own archives in Rehovot in Israel. And basically, Weizmann says, we've heard that this cabinet committee that you, that you started in 1943 has been uh, contemplating um, uh, partition, but we understand that the Jewish state that's going to be proposed is going to be too small to be viable. And Churchill hastens to assure him that, firstly, I've packed this cabinet committee with all of Zionism's friends, especially the labor leader, Leopold Amory. And he said, I promise you that you will be able to stick your, and this is basically the, uh, the quote, stick your thumb into the pie and pull out a plum piece. In other words, that the Jewish state that Churchill was proposing would be economically viable. But then he cautions Weizmann. But look, first we have to ensure that our friend, President Roosevelt, it's also a very different view of President Roosevelt than sometimes is portrayed, is re-elected. And therefore, after the American election on November 7th, 1944, is when I'll present this to Parliament, and then I'll propose it at the next Big Three meeting. And unfortunately, 24 hours earlier, on November 6th, 1944, is when two lucky gunmen uh, cut down Lord Moy. Churchill then turned his back on the plan that was never raised at Yalta, and that was the end of what might have been a viable solution uh, to Palestine. The last personality, and then I'll move on to the final part of the talk and wrap up, is Menachem Begin, uh, who became commander of the Irgun in 1943, uh, future prime minister of Israel, elected in 1977. Um, Begin is, to me, one of these fascinating characters in the history of terrorism or insurgency or of an underground warfare. Firstly, his book, The Revolt, is a classic, and it's filled with lies, at least in terms of what actually happened. I mean, it's very self, as most memoirs are, you're always going to make yourself look good and omniscient. Uh, but nonetheless, as, 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 a docu as an important document um, of insurgency, terrorism, whatever you want to call it, guerrilla warfare, underground violence, it's an enormously important uh, uh, book. I think one reason that it's so important is that Begin himself was not a military commander, which is always what I mean, as Professor Banks said, it's true. I first went to graduate school in 1976, and that's when I began studying terrorism. If you do your math, that's 39 years ago. So um, having studied this phenomena uh, for my entire professional life, what has always fascinated me is how the best strategists of terrorism, insurgency, guerrilla warfare, Mao, Che Guevara, um, Bin Laden, one has to say, none of them are trained soldiers or military men. They're all strategists, and they're often always people who understand the nexus between ideas and violence, or violence as a form of communication. And this, I think, is very clearly encapsulates uh, Begin's thinking. Uh, he was born in 1913 at sort of a backwater at the confluence of present-day Poland, Russia, and Lithuania. Um, was ruled by Poland then at that time. Um, it was rife with anti-Semitism. In fact, one of Begin's earliest memories was of walking down the street with his father, um, who was a businessman, not a particularly you know, athletic or muscular type of person. And they were walking down the street, and they saw a Polish soldier attempting to cut off the beard of a devoutly Orthodox Jew with a bayonet. And without any sort of heed for his own personal safety, his father intervened. Polish soldier, of course, pushed him away, and the father then took his, these days people had walking sticks, used his walking stick to beat the Polish soldier. Of course, this resulted in a bit of a melee or a pile-on when other Polish soldiers converged on the scene and beat the elder Begin senseless and threw him in jail. And this had a profound influence on his son's um, trajectory. His son, uh, at age 15, uh, was already, I mean, you know, we talk a lot, there was just a conference last month at the White House that's trying to figure out why people become terrorists or how they become susceptible to radicalization. I mean, one thing about Begin that was had very much in common with Stern is Begin was also an accomplished classicist, was very good at Latin and ancient Greek. So I don't know if this is any kind of a vector for white people, at least in that milieu. There's at least two data points. But anyways, very good classicist, very smart, um, but also had a real facility for public speaking and for oratory. And at age 15, he went to hear a speech given by Vladimir Jabotinsky, who was the founder of the new Zionist organization, what's known as the Revisionist Movement. 
Again, I think labels like right wing and left wing are a bit misleading. The labor socialists, of course, were the dominant political force in Palestine, and of course, were the dominant political force during the first um, 30 years of Israel's creation until Menachem Begin, the founder and leader of Likud, actually. Um, although I don't think that certainly Menachem Begin's son, Benny Begin, uh, uh, has disavowed Netanyahu. I mean, they're actually arch enemies. So I think Benny Begin would argue that Netanyahu's uh, version of, ja of Jabotinsky's ideology and of Likud is at variance with his father's. But anyway, Jabotinsky was an enormously important ideologue and um, political thinker in Zionism. And I would say, rather than right wing, left wing, whereas the dominant strain was labor Zionist, uh, labor socialist, Jabotinsky was much more of a capitalist. Um, this is a good way to put it. But the thing that was unique about Jabotinsky is that he completely um, disavowed any notions that the Palestinian Arabs could ever be bought off. That the argument that actually Netanyahu has, has used and has been often voiced uh, during basically the past century is that Jewish immigration uh, would you know, raise the socioeconomic status of both communities in this territory, that is everyone prospered, um, as they had, uh, you know, comfortable living standards, as education rose, and so on, they would learn to live with one another. And as far back as uh, 1926, Jabotinsky, in a very famous article titled The Iron Wall, said this is nonsense. And he said, firstly, it's demeaning. Uh, it implies that the Palestinian Arabs can be bought off, that they can't be bought off. This is their land. Let's face it, we're coming here and seizing their land. And his solution was, he said, the only solution is if we're determined to regain our biblical homeland was to build an iron wall that would separate our two peoples. And as controversial as that is, I mean, arguably that vision from the 1920s is what's materialized uh, today. So Jabotinsky was very much, or he saw himself as a realist in even the 1920s. He was arguing that Jews had to liquidate the diaspora and leave what was always going to be a seedbed of anti-Semitism and oppression much like Netanyahu was saying after the Charlie Hebdo and the kosher restaurant attacks, that the only place you'll be safe is in, even though it wasn't called Israel then, it was to come to uh, Palestine. But Begin was very much taken with Jabotinsky's uh, ideology. Uh, he came to Palestine in uh, 1943, took over the Irgun. But along the way, having become a follower of Jabotinsky, he joined the youth movement associated with the Revisionist Party, and that was a group known as Betar. And there, Begin became the head of propaganda. I mean, the 1930s, the word propaganda does not have the negative connotations it has today. I have to say, too, in the 1940s, the word terrorism doesn't have the pejorative connotations it has today. You know, just a couple of months ago, the BBC published uh, a statement, basically their house style rules are not to use to avoid using the word terrorism. You read about the attack on that Pakistani school in December. Right, and nowhere in the New York Times or the Washington Post do they mention the word terrorism or terror. I mean, if attacking children isn't terrorism or terrorist, if it's militants or rebels, I mean, it shows how this term has become so politically loaded in our time. But in the 1930s and 40s, no one had that hesitation. The BBC, the New York Times, the London Times, all newspapers use the word terrorism to describe the Jewish violence and the Arab violence. Um, but in other words, propaganda was also a word now that's fallen out of favor. But Begin was, was a very accomplished propagandist. And that's, I think, what he brought in this, I will wrap up with, with this final observation, is that's what I think he brought to the Irgun, and what was so transformative, I think, in the trajectory of history following World War II, is he understood that his handful of fighters could never defeat the British. And what he sought to do was transform. I mean, there had obviously been terrorism and guerrilla conflicts and uprisings against British rule from you know, from certainly from the uh, from uh, from the uh, from from the 18th century, if not before. Uh, obviously, an uprising against British rule occurred here as well. Uh, but Begin's point was to go beyond the locus of the conflict, to appeal to an audience not just within the confines of where the conflict was being fought, but to appeal to an international audience, which has really become the hallmarks of international terrorism. And not only that, to appeal to an audience not only in the in the home capital of the foreign occupier or the foreign oppressor, but to appeal to all the world's capitals. So Begin's message was directed as much in Paris and in Moscow as in London, and as much in New York as in Washington. Well, Washington was obvious because that's the capital of the United States. New York 
the appeal was because that was where the fledgling United Nations was needed. And Vega was one of the first to understand the importance of appealing and gaining the legitimacy of, uh, of the United Nations in support of these struggles of, of national liberation. And we see many of the same techniques that Begin used, the spectacular, daring, dramatic acts of violence that were choreographed to coincide, to attract world attention. In the book, this is what Begin describes as the glass house, where the world would be looking into Palestine, would be drawn to events in Palestine because of these dramatic acts of violence, and where this would serve as a platform for him to appeal to world opinion, especially in the fledgling United Nations, but also in, in Washington, Moscow as well, um, to support the Zionist cause. Now, and I'll stop here. At the end of the day, I mean, history is never monocausal. And even as a terrorism expert, I would be a fool to stand up and say, World War I started when Gabriel Princip uh, assassinated the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Habsburgs throne in Sarajevo in 1914. I mean, we know that was one of the main triggers of the actual fulminate, but there were a host of other reasons that gave rise to World War I, the Anglo-German uh, naval rivalry, uh, France's alliance with Russia, Russia's own uh, imperial intentions to create a pan-Slavic union in the Balkans, the decaying Ottoman Empire, the de equally decaying Habsburg Empire, all these things, Balkan nationalism, fed into a cauldron of factors that led to World War I. But at the same time, we don't deny that terrorism had a signal role as part of those events, as part of that concatenation of circumstances that gave rise to the First World War. Similarly, the argument I'm making in the book, unlike this very uncharitable uh, reviewer in the New York Times, I'm not saying that Menachem Begin defeated the British uh, Empire single-handedly. That's, that's, not, that's not at all the argument. Certainly, there were any number of even more important factors that resulted in the creation of Israel. I mean, first and foremost, of course, was the Holocaust and the sympathy for the Jewish survivors of, of, of Hitler's death camps. Secondly, it was the hundreds of thousands of Jewish displaced persons that even two and three and four years after World War II were still languishing in displaced persons camps across Europe, unable to emigrate um, uh, to, to the West. I mean, obviously, absolutely pivotal was President Truman's support of the creation of the State of Israel, even against the advice of the State Department and his own Secretary of State, uh, George Marshall. Of course, it was the patient diplomacy and own information operations of the mainstream moderate Zionist movement. But at the same time, though, and this is, I think, why the book is so long, is the first six chapters talk about the period from 1917 until the start of World War II. The next four chapters focus on World War II, so that gets us to 10 chapters. The remaining nine chapters focus on not the, well, British rule in Palestine ended in May 1948. The book actually ends in September 1947 because that's when Britain goes to the United Nations and basically hands the problem of Palestine off to the British. And why nine chapters focuses on the post-war is to show, I think conclusively, the huge influence that terrorism had on British policy in deciding to leave Palestine. And there's lots of other reasons behind that, but I'm going to stop now, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Great. Questions? Don't be bashful. Who's first? I, uh, I saw it. Uh, a headline from an article a few days ago before Netanyahu was re-elected where he said that if he's elected or re-elected, there, there will be no Palestinian state. I'm wondering if you think that that will be Israel's policy in the future or if that's just him trying to get elected. <laughs> well, you know, this is part of the problem. Anytime you talk about Palestine, so that's impossible to separate the, the presence <laughs> from the past in some respects. Um, well, the best interpretation, I think, is the one that it was, you know, uh, Netanyahu is, you know, amongst the most uh, cynical and demagogic of, of Israeli politicians who's willing to say almost anything to get reelected, and obviously the strategy worked. Um, I think he's bent on, uh, it, by taking a fourth term in office and becoming the longest serving prime minister in Israeli history, um, and he was desperate to obtain that outcome. Um, so, you know, in, 
I, I hope that the cynics are right that this was just a ploy. I think that if he wants to avoid a complete breakdown of relations with the United States, which we're also which we're also in a pretty poor state right now, I think it's impo it's impossible to actually enforce that as a policy um, unless Israel wants to become completely isolated in the world. Um, I think he's setting out an extremist position, as many negotiators do with a view towards some compromise. But of course, that compromise is, is bound up with what he has made the signal issue of his administration, which is, of course, the question of Iran. And all these things are, are linked. So you know, my own personal view is that I think it was really a last minute desperate ploy by someone who was desperate to you know, remain in power that would be realized. But that's not to say that I expect necessarily a lot of progress either. But it's impossible for me ha to see how he can really adhere to that. And a lot of it's going to depend on the coalition that he puts together. Now, he siphoned off a lot of the votes that would have gone to more extremist, small right-wing parties. But that means that whatever you know, government he forms is going to have to have centrist elements, because they did much better as well. And that may well temper his, you know, until the actual coalition is formed, I think it's impossible to say, but I have a suspicion that may temper those types of views. How are you trying to separate out the effect of terrorism as a cause of British retrenchment from the region in a time when, in other areas, British retrenchment was also occurring, but due to completely separate factors? How can you kind of parse out the, the amount of influence just terrorism had, and how much is that relative to the other factors? No, that's a very important question. I mean, this is one reason why I drilled so deeply into almost every facet of uh, British decision making, and especially having access to the intelligence reports. That's what made, uh, unlike any other country, this, the British Security Service, MI5, most of their records, uh, because of the work of Christopher Andrew, are actually accessible to scholars now. I mean, it's extraordinarily rare anywhere. And I mean, that, that's exactly an important point because. You know, don't forget, in 19, early 1947, Britain had granted independence to India. Lots of people argued with granting of independence of India, why did Britain need to retain the Middle East? That British Empire was unraveling in any event, that um, it was just a matter of time before they got out of Palestine. Actually, I think that's true. But I think the key to understanding this, and this is why you've got to you know, take this deep dive into the archives, is what becomes very apparent is that Britain was, it wasn't really until, I think the big turning point is in February 1947, which is when Ernest Bevan, the foreign secretary, for the first time says it's just not worth staying in Palestine because of the military costs of staying there. In 1947, there were still British soldiers serving in Palestine who had been drafted on January 1st, 1944. So you can imagine, you're drafted to fight World War II against the Nazis and against the Imperial Japanese Army. And then three years later, you're still in uniform and you're in Palestine. Britain had 100,000 troops in Palestine, basically a tenth of its military, at a time when it was under grave financial pressures to reduce spending across the board. So you have Bevan until then arguing that for reasons of prestige, but also for strategic importance, Britain has to retain Palestine. And the strategic importance is that Britain knew because of the 1946 Anglo-Egyptian Treaty that they would have to vacate the Canal Zone within a matter of years, which in fact happened, and that Nasser comes and nationalizes it. They thought as an alternative, they wanted to have a pliable government in Palestine once they left that would grant them treaty and basing rights, especially in Haifa, that Haifa is one of the world's great deep water ports, that the British Navy could be based there. And then should anyone ever, when they had to leave the Suez, should anyone ever attempt to block the Suez Canal, which Britain still thought was vital for strategic, and also Britain was creating a dominion to further British contact with India, with, the far, with, with its former colonies in the Far East that it believed it eventually would lose, it still wanted to ensure its access to the Suez Canal. Of course, in 1956, Britain and France invaded Suez for exactly that reason. So even a decade later, there still was this preoccupation. So there was this desire, especially the British equivalent of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, constantly argued up until the bitter end, up until the submission of the um, Palestine problem to the United Nations, that Britain had to at least resolve the Palestine um, question in some manner that was favorable to British strategic interests. So what they hoped, in essence, was a unitary Arab-dominated state that would be probably similar to Jordan, 
where of course King Abdullah was then, Britain had put in, put in place, that would be favorably inclined to Britain in terms of these uh, treaty relations. Secondly, was access to oil. Um, the Iraq Petroleum Pipeline, which originated in Kirkuk and Mosul, went across Iraq and the Levant and terminated in Haifa. And the huge oil facilities that are still in Haifa port are basically a throwback to the 1930s when the uh, Iraq uh, Petroleum Pipeline was created. So they wanted access to the oil. So you have until 1947 both the foreign minister who really, and Bevan was the, the dominant figure in British policy in the post-war much more, let's say, than his, his colonial uh, office um, counterpart. And Attlee, Clement Attlee actually was creating you know, national health system and the welfare state in Britain was very focused on domestic issues. So he had actually given most of I mean, the creation of NATO, many of the, uh, of, of the post-war institutions were a product of, of Bevan. So Bevan was responsible for this. And you really have in February 1947, and I can, I, you detect it I, in the documents, it's Jewish terrorism that is finally convincing Bevan that you know this isn't worth it. And the quote that was selectively used in the New York Times article is from the Chancellor of the Exchequer, which was the head of the Treasury, Hugh Dalton, who has to pay for this, who said in September 1947, we can no longer afford to have a headquarters or have a base on a wasp's nest. Now, Tom Segev very misleadingly says that the Irgun was one of many wasps. When you look at the actual statement, the actual document, he's talking about the Irgun as only one wasp and saying it's impossible. If we, you know, we can't, you know, as long as Palestine and we're trying to suppress this terrorist campaign that after three years, 100,000 troops despite a 20 to 1 superiority to the terrorists, there are basically 20 soldiers for every member of the Irgun. There was one British soldier or policeman for every six Jews in Palestine. I mean, this is a phenomenal ratio of security forces to civilian population. And it was basically the terrorism that was making it untenable. Britain hoped to hand off the problem, anticipated the Arab states would rise up, swarm into the new state of Israel, crush it, and that what emerged from that would be a favorable government that would be still amenable to British strategic interests. But I mean, this is the fascinating thing, even despite having handed over India, Britain still wants a strategic foothold in the Mediterranean, and with the loss of uh, the basing rights in Suez, it becomes Palestine. Um, I was just wondering, so in this last campaign um, with Israel and Hamas, uh, Israel clearly dominated on the um, battlefield, but the uh, Hamas arguably was winning the PR campaign. And is that sort of PR battle where the state's not competing even on the same level, is that historically how it's been, or is that sort of a new formation? Well, this was also very much Begin's strategy. I think what we often forget is that terrorism is a strategy of provocation. It's trying to provoke governments to do things that the terrorists hope will be useful to their cause and prove immensely counterproductive or even isolating to the government. I mean, that was exactly Begin's strategy, to provoke the British to repress the Jews, to close the gates to salvation from, uh, um, you know, Display, prevent displaced persons after World War II from coming to Palestine, and to shine that, you know, put that pressure on um, on on Britain. Terrorism also has long been a strategy to provoke a broader conflict that the terrorists believe will create exactly the instability and the chaos that will play into their hands. So, I mean, Professor Bank, well, actually, we were both talking about this because you were about to come to Israel at the time, but you know, last, uh, last June, Hamas's star had pretty much fallen, in fact. I mean, it had to form a unity government with the Palestine, with Fatah and Palestine Authority <coughs> because of its weakness. And the events that then led to the Israeli response, clearly, as you point out, I think it's true, benefited Hamas and isolated Israel more, provoked Israel. That Israel then was portrayed in the world as the aggressor. And this is exactly a strategy of provocation that Begin used very successfully. And it's, again, this interplay between violence and propaganda or violence and information operations that I think has become, you know, sort of uh, enshrined in modern terrorism, uh, uh, modern terrorism strategy. I mean, and that's, that's a very interesting point. Um, what I've often found in my years of, of studying this phenomena is that terrorist organizations always learn from one another, and even from their enemies. Um, as I said earlier, Stern studied um, the Irish example. Uh, uh, Itzhak Shamir's underground uh, code name was Michael, in honor of Michael Collins. Right? Begin also studied the Irish exemplar. 
I mean, we know that other groups, uh, AOCA and George Grievous in Cyprus, clearly studied um, the air gun. Uh, FLN, there's evidence that they also very closely in Algeria studied the air gun. And of course, uh, you know, a copy of the revolt and other books on the Jewish terrorist campaign were found in Al-Qaeda's well-stocked library in Kandahar by US forces in November 2011. So you see very much this learning curve where governments, on the other hand, are much less adept at learning. I think probably last question. I think we have time for one more. Yeah, well, I was going to ask, given the wealth of history you've had and the nuance you've seen, how much does it align with the way that history is told or taught in Israel today? And I'm thinking particularly, I know there's a new Begin Museum, or I think it's relatively new. Does it, does it speak to this, or do you see it being presented differently? Uh, well, the, it, it's called the Menachem Begin Heritage Center. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, I think, right, well, look, Freedom fighter or terrorist, that's a, an unsavory part of any country's birth that is generally you know, put aside. It's interesting, when you go to the museum, the emphasis is almost completely on the Camp David Accords. And as Begin as a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and as a man of peace and a, and a visionary and a strategist. I mean, you know, fair enough. That's where the emphasis is. You know, this is, this is why I win no friends with this book. Because on the one hand, I try to shed light on one dimension of the creation of Israel that has largely been ignored because no one wants to admit to terrorist antecedents. Um, on the other hand, sort of giving, let's say, Begin and his, you know, his followers uh, their due, uh, the fact that I call them terrorists. Uh, and again, I'm not making a value judgment. I may be one of the few people in the world that don't view terrorism as a pejorative term. Uh, I try to approach it, as, approach it as a clinician. I mean, to me, it's a tactic. Uh, it's, uh, and, um, so in that sense, you know, it emphasizes the more positive aspects of his background. I'd say in general in Israel, up until Begin's election as prime minister, this whole ro role of, of, uh, of the Irgun, of the stirring of Jabotinsky was you know, sort of airbrushed out of Israeli history. And the emphasis was always on all these other, which as I said, are not only as important or more important, but that's not the same as saying terrorism had absolutely no role. And that was really the purpose of the book. Join me in thanking Professor. Small token of our appreciation for making the trip north today. Well, the last time I came here, you gave me a sweatshirt, which I still wear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.